Okay, so um, I'm going to actually go through exactly the same thing all over again, but um, uh, focusing on how you do this in Wacom. So being as you've got a big data dump there with a lot of text, I mean, the, the intention here is to give you a flavor of what you need, and then you will probably down, um, you can download these tutorials and go through them page by page at a much um, slower rate. Um, so this is just focusing now on how to run Wacom, and then Joe will talk about the, the, even the smaller changes that you need to do to run Wacom X. So we're kind of narrowing down here. Uh, this talk was put together um, uh, mostly by Mike Mills, who's the Wacom liaison, and he would be the point. So our suggestion uh, is that you would first run a very simple CAM uh, configuration. That is the, the low top version of CESM. And once you've got that running, that ensured that you have all of your libraries kind of that you need. And, and then you can move on to a Wacom case and test that or maybe jump straight to a Wacom X case. But um, so here I'm just going to talk about um, uh, what the Wacom configuration of the community Earth system model and uh, how you, different ways you can configure that. Um, a very qu sort of quick start guide on the five um, commands you need to issue to run Wacom. Um, uh, in a sort of standard configuration. And um, then we'll really get into things that you might want to do with Wacom if you want to use it for science, because you can download the model, run a standard comp set, but you'll just be making hopefully the same data set that we've already made. So you're going to want to do something with the model, and maybe that is such a thing as I want to out hourly output at a certain, at my location, say. Um, or, um, or I want to drive it with a certain set of reanalysis or something like that. So changing the output would be probably the first thing you would want to do without tweaking the code. And then um, maybe uh, you want to start actually changing some code. Um, uh, a few examples of things you might want to do are change your reaction rate, say, um, uh, um, or change the solar spectrum that's going in, say, uh, the standard configuration for, for solar max, and you want to do a solar medium case or something like that. Um, or you want to change the boundary condition. Now, if, uh, say, for instance, um, you want to run not for uh, present day, but you want to run for turn of the century. Well, you'd want to put the CO2 back to 1900. So those are sort of another thing you might want to change. Um, and then um, we'll get at the end into a little bit about how you might look at your output and um, test whether or not you're actually creating something that is reasonable. Okay, so uh, here's a, a sort of block diagram of um, the community system model. So it's as, um, for um, Wacom and, and, and CAM, most configurations have, you have four components. You've already heard about this, and then there's the coupler that kind of ties all these together. But this is how different ways to configure it. So for the atmosphere, you are going to be running Wacom. And um, within that, there are several different options in running Wacom. Um, the basic one would be a free running version. That would be one in which you're not constraining the model at all. And for that, in that particular configuration, you could run um, a, a, either a, a, a fixed forcing. So maybe you'd run a pre-industrial 1850 case, or you could run present day or run into the future uh, with a few con future condition, or you'd run transient. So that means uh, time varying forcing. Um, yeah, other other um, useful configurations, one in particular, especially if you want to look at an event, is the specified dynamics version of the model. And that's where we actually can nudge the lower part of the model with, with uh, reanalysis data. So if I want to look at the 2009 sudden stratospheric warming, I can force the model without that uh, stratosphere uh, change and see how the mesosphere and, and above uh, is affected. Uh, so of course, specified dynamics is always done in transient mode. Um, another one that's really not tested, but if you are interested in, say, doing some simimpler dynamical studies, uh, I want to look at strut warm frequencies, um, the effect of tweaking a gravity wave parameterization, but I want to end many, many years quickly, you can switch off interactive chemistry. And here, so it's not solving and transporting all those species, and maybe you get a two and a half times speed up of the model doing that. And uh, so that's called specified chemistry. That's a pretty new version. Uh, but might be useful for some people. And then the other components, uh, you have these options of running uh, specified data. So if I, if I um, 
want to um, you know, use observed SSTs, I could do that. Or you can have an interactive, um, say, deep ocean model that, um, if you want to run into the future. And same with land and sea ice. Same kind of options there. Okay, so you've already um, learned how to download the code, uh, download the source distribution, and the first thing you're told to do is to go into the scripts directory. And um, as uh, so, you see, so that's where you've downloaded the source using SVN, and you go into scripts, and you do a create new case. And the easiest thing to do first is list what the configurations are. So um, you can create new case dash list, and there you'll you'll list you'll see the configurations for Wacom. So the first one that you might want to try is what we call an F2000 Wacom case here. And this is present day um, climate uh, uh, um, atmosphere with a prescribed ocean. So F um, means uh, specified uh, ocean. And the B, what we call the B comp sets, this is a different comp set as the configuration. Um, our interactive ocean. So, so this is the, probably the simplest one you might want to try first. Um, so, uh, for an FCOMP set, a data ocean, it's actually run on the, on the, um, all our all Wacom is configured to run at about two degrees, 1.9 degrees by 2.5, 1.9 by latitude, 2.5 in longitude. So, for an FCOMP set, you actually run the uh, specify the ocean on the same grid as the atmosphere is running, and so that. That grid for the for the ocean is the same resolution, so that's this F19, F19. But if you're running with a deep ocean, then you actually run that at about a one degree resolution, and so that's why this the atmosphere is run at two degrees, the oceans run at one degree. Okay. Um, okay. So you've so you've listed it and you've said, okay, I want to run this F2000 case. So there's the command that you can enter to create this. There's the, specifying the resolution, the comp set, the machine I'm running on. Blue fire at NCAR, and here's my name. This is where it's going to go. It's going to go into this case, and I'm going to call this some weird long name that you've made up here. Um, and finding on, so this is anything you want it to be, you know, my run dot ten or something. Um, then you go into that case that you've made here. So go over to there, and you do this configure desk case option. And um, one thing that's going to come up in the new um, version of the model is you can actually then preview the input into the model. Now, does anyone know what a everyone know what name lists are? Um, uh, name lists are essentially just a list uh, ASCII file that lists all of the inputs into the model. Um, so you can actually um, preview those in the new version. That's not in the in the one that's distributed now. That'll be in 1.1. Otherwise, to look at the name list, you need to just you'll have to build the model. So. Um, so this is one of the name lists. It's, a, it's, a, it's got all kinds of sections um, that are, start with an ampersand. So this particular section here um, deals with aerosol deposition. This is the uh, aerosols. Here's now cam in parm. That's sort of the inputs to the uh, atmosphere model. And um, there's lots of that you can go to this website and list all of the different uh, name and uh, look at the nameless parameters that you can specify. Um, perhaps some of the more interesting ones here is what output you would like. And uh, so, okay, you've, you've um, configured case and then you're going to run the build to, 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 to generate the source code. And then you'll look at the, that after it's built, it will, you'll create a, it'll create a dot run file. And here's where you specify things uh, at NCAR, you would specify something like, here's my charge number because everyone you know, need to bill your time. And this is how much time I'm asking. So in this particular configuration, I'm asking for 19 minutes, because I'm only going to test this out and run five days. And um, you know, when I do this, I bump this one up to premium so I can get in quick. Um, and so this is the queue that would be specified here. Um, OK, so then um, once you, so you can have a look at the configuration, edit that as you need, and then you would um, uh, run the submit script. Um, so what configurations? So that's um, sort of very short uh, list of, uh, of how to get the model running. But And I said, though, that's the F2000 case. But what cases do we have available for you? Well, we've run um, 
we've done the, run the model and have it set up to run from 1850 all the way up to 2100 under a variety of different um, scenarios based on, on the IPCC CMIP5 um, uh, activity. Uh, so you could, the F2000 case, the present day case, you can run this sort of recent history or do a full 20th century run and then extend that out into the future. Um, so here are the, here's a list of the B comp set. This is the one with interactive ocean. So you have a pre-industrial case in 1850, um, and this is just perpetual 1850. And um, this is the case that you would run to ensure that, say, your model is in balance. Um, because if you're running present day, then the atmosphere is out of balance, and so it will drift. But pre-industrial, when you didn't have a drifting CO2, everything, you would hope that your model for this case is in balance. And, does, and the, say the mean surface temperature isn't drifting too much. Um, then you've got a, a, a transient case here. This is the 20th century case. So this will take you all the way up to present to 2005. Um, and um, so what's the difference in here? Oh, but say that um, you've got limited computer time and you don't really want to start from 1850 to get up to present day, well, you could start at 1955 here. And these are, these are just what comes out of the box. If you wanted to say, well, I know that the guys at NCAR can give me a 1990 input file, a start file, and I'll run from 1990. I'm only interested in that. You could, you could do that. So you just have to contact us for a file. So, and then we've got the future scenarios, and these are uh, these what they call RCPs, um, uh, re recommended concent concentration pathways. And the two these numbers are actually the um, climate forcing at 2100. So, 8.5 watts per meter squared at the end of the 21st century. That would be the um, the climate forcing in that scenario. And then 2.6 is a a much weaker um, climate change scenario. Okay, for the um, F2000 case, this is sort of a, a great debugging type um, scenario. This is just perpetual year 2000. Now, I, I mentioned that, um, oh, well, if you run present day, then your model might drift if you had an interactive ocean because the atmosphere is not in balance. But if you specify the surface temperatures, then the model stays at that temperature. So it makes sense to run an, an F, uh, a, a repeating present day case with a specified ocean. So you can do that and test out something like a new gravity wave parameterization. Or I, it's not critical. No, it, it just turns on uh, something in the land model, but I don't think it's very, it's very critical. No, it's not. It's you just normally turn it on. Yeah. Okay. And um, that case, this F two thousand, is the basis for the Wacom X case. You hear about next. Okay. So, so how do I change model output? So, so in those, um, in that, in the name list, you'll see a whole list of variables. Um, these are, and um, but they may be not your favorite variable. Is there? Um, in fact, you might want to look at something else. And there is a master field list of all the variables available for output. And this tells you where to look. So um, currently there are 2,300 variables that you can put out through the history um, for just the atmosphere. And uh, so if you go, once you've, um, if you look at the ATM log file, um, which is generated in the run directory, you'll see a master field list there. And you'll see all of the different um, fields that you could actually so you could sort of do a, a search there to see if your variable you want is, is in there. Um, so then, you, okay, you've identified something you want to what you want to output. How do you how do you get it out? Well, you go you um, create a user name list. So this is user nl cam. So you can do these for the other components too, but mostly we do these just for the atmosphere component. And uh, that. There, your, you, the different parameters you can you can specify. This one average flag per tape. Uh, you should say, well, um, well, the uh, let, let me put it this way. So this is the frequency at which output can, um, the model can be output. So the first one is always zero. This is um, monthly mean output. You always generate monthly means, um, almost always. Um, and uh, so the next file, it, and if it has a minus in front of it. 
It says it's, uh, that refers to hours. If it doesn't have a minus, that refers to time steps. So here it's saying it once per day, minus 24. So once per day, it's, at, it's saying, so the, the first one was monthly, so that's A, that means average, so it's a monthly mean that's being put out. If you want, now you're putting out daily data and you're putting it out instantaneously. So this is just a snapshot. If you start the model at uh, midnight, every midnight, it's gonna put out a snapshot of the model. So that's the, the I here, instantaneous. And these lists, so the first Finkel one, that's a file include one, that lists all the variables that go into the monthly mean. So here you can start changing things. I want to look, I want temperatures and uh, horizontal winds put out every, every day. So if you were interested in looking at um, something at a higher frequency, maybe you would change this to every three hours and you could put out winds and temperatures every three hours if you felt like it. Um, there, you may say, um, so there's a new feature here, um, which I haven't tested, but I think it's um, great for, pe um, for uh, those in the uh, sort of ground-based observing community that want, want to look at what's going on right about their location. And so you can actually change this output to not put it out globally, but to put it out um, at a particular location. So this is a uh, um, longitude latitude. Um, so this, um, hit the, the history file associated with Finkel 4 will put out these variables now only at this location. And here I'm going to asking for it every six hours. So, and you, you can put multiple locations in a file. And here I'm asking for two locations every three hours, and I could have a different list of variables for those. So that's, uh, so that's um, really uh, a nice feature, I think, for, for especially for the Cedar com um, community. Okay. So Finkels, they list the variables you want. If some, some uh, variables are hard-coded in, they're always coming out, and if you really don't want those, you can fexel them or, or exclude them. So, um, what's this? Okay, so this describes, again, uh, just goes into more detail on, uh, you can set any one of these history files to only put out at a particular latitude and longitude, and then you would change the frequency. Now, mfilt is just specifying how many data timestamps you put per file. So, so, for instance, if you're looking at one location, um, and you're putting out three hourly data, well, it's one location, so that um, you could put in, say, you know, uh, a year's worth of data per file. So you may put in, um, you know, 365 times four here, if you had every six hour, six hour data. Of course, if you're putting out a global field, um, and you're putting out a lot of them in the monthly means, you may only put, put one, you might have just one file per month for the monthly means. So mfilt tells you here, monthly means, um, one file per uh, month, 24-hour um, data for these variables, I'm putting it out every day, and I'm gonna put a year in one file. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that one. Another really useful uh, tool that we've added and recently is uh, what we call sort of uh, satellite sampling. So you can specify now a, um, a list of satellite locations. So, it's the list is a list of universal time, latitude, and longitude. And then the, and you tell, the, tell it which output you want, and it, will, it doesn't interpolate, it just says what's the closest time step and closest grid box to that satellite observation, and it'll output that profile into a file for you. So um, that's called sat-hist finkel. So this says I want these variables put out along a satellite track and I'm going to specify what those, that satellite track is in a NetCDF file. And I'm going to put um, 50, 500,000 profiles in a, in a file. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. Um, and um, here's the, output, uh, the name of the output file. So um, what is the, the, this um, NetCDF file that you specify is pretty simple uh, format. Uh, the required um, variables in that file are the time of day, and the date, the latitude and longitude, and that uniquely gives you a location um, and a time during the model run. So the point there is that in the model coming out in November, you'll actually out, be able to put out a cluster around a particular location. 
not just the nearest one. Um, so we used this in the recent HEPA into comparison, looking at the Halloween storm and comparing profiles to um, what was seen by MIPAS, and it was very effective. And then those profiles, uh, you can put them at a very high frequency. You don't need to be dumping global fields every time step to get the nearest, file, uh, nearest profile. And then you can pass those profiles off to the instrument team and they can run them through their averaging kernels and generate all, as close to apples to apples as we can get currently. Okay, so um, this is a new feature that uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about it too much. Um, I mean, we, <laughs> because it won't be available in the code you can download, but, um, but yeah, you can preview the na name list um, prior to doing a build. Currently, you just have to do the build, and then you can go into the case docs directory and look at the name list there. All right. Okay, so um, you may say, well, 23 or whatever, is it, 100 variables isn't enough. I really want this one. Um, and um, then you're going to have to go and change the code. And... Um, what you would do is you would go into the code and find the variable that you're interested in um, at a per particular point in the code. So again, go into the, you're gonna go into the main source directory and copy this into your, that file into your source mods directory. And then within there, you modify that. You don't modify the, f the, um, the main source trunk. And in there, you can add in, uh, you need to add two calls to get a variable out in the histories. One is add field, which defines the type of variable it is. Is it global? Is it just a two-dimensional lat lawn? Um, what's its units? Uh, long data, you know, and essentially metadata. And then um, within the code, wherever it's being calculated, at some point you say you can out field. You can say write it here. So you know exactly at which point it's being averaged. And the nice thing about this is all of that feature that the with the capability of putting it out at a certain satellite location, monthly means, hourly data, everything is already built in. So, so you don't have to write, oh, you know, I'm, I'm putting out um, this field and I would really like to put it out in multiple ways, mean, uh, monthly means, everything. doesn't matter. The, the history um, code uh, for creating history files handles all this seamlessly. So, so, um, so that's one thing, how, how to change output. I would suggest that if you're gonna look at the, you know, if you wanna do that, kinda of just do a grep for an add field and a routine that you're looking at and see how other variables were put out and then kinda of do it by example. Um, okay, so one thing I mentioned earlier is you might wanna change the reaction rates in the model. Um, you're trying to solve the ozone deficit problem and you wanna try a new reaction rate or add a reaction. So chemistry within Wacom is different than CAM. CAM, it's specified chemistry. Uh, within um, Wacom, it's solved, it, uh, it's solved uh, as um, interactively. Um, and in that situation, you have to, you give it a big, well, essentially a preprocessor input file that is run at build time. And that generates source code, which solves the reactions. So um, to change chemistry, you actually have to go back and currently you have to do a configure-cleanall, erase your whole source tree essentially to rerun, to, to change the chemistry here, and then you rebuild. So um, the input file for the chemical preprocessor that generates the Fortran is um, in this directory here. And what you should do is probably copy that into a local source mods directory and start modifying that. And the structure is that it has a list of reactions, or sorry, species up here. So maybe, for instance, you, um, so you, know, you could in fact say, I want to add a D region code, D region chemistry code to Wacom. Well, you could start putting in all of your cluster ions up here if you wanted to. Um, then you decide whether or not explicit or implicit um, that's just the way the, the code solves things. For long-lived um, species, you would do an explicit solver. For short-lived species, you would do an implicit solver. Um, this is, uh, so, and you have to take into consideration when I mean short-lived, it's, it's the shortest um, uh, life within the whole model domain. So something may be very long-lived at one region of the atmosphere but a very short-lived in the other. You, if it is very short-lived, you need to put it in the implicit section. 
And then you've got the reactions, uh, photolysis reactions and other reactions, the gas phase reactions down here. So to change a, um, a gas phase reaction rate, um, there are different ways of specifying them. Uh, if it's just a constant, you just list the reaction and put the, and, and, this, and there's a semicolon and then the constant reaction rate. Uh, Arrhenius type reactions, then you specify the, the A and the B here. Uh, tro rate reactions, this, they form, they're in this um, form here, and then you specify a list of uh, inputs there. So what if it doesn't fall into one of these standard categories of a reaction? Then you, you say, well, I'm, okay, I'm going to give, um, give you a formula for, the, for this particular reaction, and you just give it, a, for, in the input file, you give it a tag here, and you say this is user reaction O plus O2. And then you have to go in and write the code to calculate that reaction if it doesn't fall in here. And you put that in the routine mo user react f90. So here's an example of um, the O plus O2 reaction from the code, because that doesn't fall into that. It's a three body recombination reaction. And you can see here that it's a, um, it's, it's a constant times one over temperature to the, to the 2.4 here. So, so um, that's just a way if it, if, if it doesn't fall into that, into one of those simple things. And so you actually have to then write a little bit of code to change the chemistry. Okay. So um, the one thing is, if you are going to um, change the chemistry, then you need to provide an extra uh, input into the uh, one of the uh, XML files that, that, it, that defines um, how to uh, configure the, the model. And the one is this EMV conf. And in there, you'll find um, uh, you'll uh, you'll find a cam configs option. And the line that you have to add in here is you want to add in user mech in file. And then you, you're going to put that file that you modified that had the chemistry in it in here. And, and whatever, wherever you decide to put it, it's up to you. And then it will use that as input into the model. But as you need to reconfigure the whole model if you're going to do that. So you don't do this very often. Okay, so that was, that's probably a um, pretty advanced way of model, um, changing the, um, the model requires a, a deep rebuild of the model and everything, but if you want to just change things in the name list, it's much simpler. Um, you can just create this user nlcam file and specify different inputs there. Uh, one of them that you might want to do is change the solar input file. So there's a, there are a couple of files in the Wacom that do that. One is the solar parms file, and that contains things like F107 and KP and AP. Uh, which is used in a number of ways. Um, we use MSYS to specify the upper boundary condition, and that takes as input F107 and KP. Um, uh, and the um, Aurora module is driven through these variables as well. So you can create a, um, a KP or AP, I forget which, is related to hemispheric power, and then that goes into the Aurora module. It's the same Aurora module that's in the uh, TIEGCM. Um, and then um, the other thing is that you need spectral radiance here, which is uh, usually um, in this particular case, it's um, annual mean uh, solar radiances um, that extend from, this is provided by Judith Lean. And so it's a, it's a time by wavelength file. And uh, you may want to change that. So that has this covers wavelengths longer than Lyman alpha. Below Lyman alpha, we 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 have another parameterization for fluxes based on F107. Okay, so this just is a very simple case here where I want to run a, um, instead of, so the, the input parameters are usually based on, say, some parameter and a time. Now, if you want to run fixed, the easiest way to do that is just pick a time in the very distant past and a time in the very distant future and, it will, and give it the same numbers for both then it will just interpolate and always give you the same number. It's an easy way to do that. So in this situation, we go from year 101 to year 22,000. And we're saying, OK, KP, the first year was 4, and KP was the second year, uh, the last year was 4. So it's always going to give you 4, and it's always going to give you 210 for F107 and F107A. So this would be like a, a solar max type configuration. 
So you can create a very simple netcdf file that just has this and play around with these numbers. But be, be warned that this drives part of the model, but your solar radiance file should also match that, what you're driving. Okay, and so this is the input file. Um, won't go through all this, but it's essentially wavelength, bandwidth, spectral radiance, total solar radiance, those sort of things. Okay. So how do I change a boundary condition? Um, so here, here again, we are, uh, it may be a little too much detail, but what com what's coming in if you want to do climate change studies, and here's the CO2 comes in at the lower boundary condition in the model, and say you wanted to do a double CO2 scenario or you wanted to do a pre-industrial scenario. Well, you could take the input file here that we normally use and you could modify that file by scaling it back or picking out a certain time. You just follow the format of the file and then you can start modifying things like I'm going to change CO2, scale it back by 0.833 and when you do this, for some reason, it wipes out the unit, so you actually have to add those back in. It's a gotcha. I don't know why. So you can, you can mo modify how the, the forcing from the lower boundary um, by taking the input file as specified in the name list, ATM in, modifying it, and then specifying a new FLBC file within your user NL cam. So, okay. So maybe I just said all that. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so you may also need to change the initial condition. And in this situation, you again go to user NL, uh, to the ATM in, and you'll see the input file that is used for the model. For F2000, it's this um, cam2.i initial condition file 2000. And you could tweak that file too. Again, you could take that file and make it consistent with your boundary condition by scaling the CO2 by the same scaling factor and then you would put that NC data um, would be pointing then to your new file within your user NLCAM. Okay, I think I'll skip that. Um, yeah, there's a little too much detail. Okay, so that was how to change the file. Um, now you want to, you run the model and you've got some output, you want to look at it. So there are many ways to look at, look at um, Wacom output. It's standard NetCDF. Any package that can look at NetCDF can be used. Um, I don't like referring or um, referring to sort of software you have to purchase, but, but one um, we do uh, use a lot is IDL. And a lot of people I sh around here, I'm sure, use IDL. But of course, you could use MATLAB or um, NCL. But if you, if you have access to IDL at uh, your institution, then we have a nice little widget that we've written in IDL called uh, GOV, G-E-O-V. And you can pull that, uh, we put a link on the um, Wacom webpage to get that source code to do that. And that's nice because it has all the variables here. You can, uh, latitude, longitude, and the level you want to look at, the timestamp. And you can make, up here you'll see different options as far as I want to do a, a 2D plot or a 1D plot. You can do global means, at, um, uh, latitude, longitude at a certain height, zonal means. Time, um, you could look at the time evolution of the global mean at a certain height, all sorts of things like that. It's very flexible and really nice for quickly looking at the data. Um, you could also open up two files simultaneously and difference them. See, okay, is my model producing the F2000 result the first time I ran it? So um, that's one uh, useful tool. Oh, I see. There's some weird things going in here. So here, I guess this shows um, the, uh, that in the 2D plot you can have latitude versus longitude. And here's a picture of a zonal mean latitude temperature um, between 0 and uh, 40 kilometers. So there's the, the tropopause right there. Okay, um, there's also a bunch of uh, really nice diagnostics if you want to do climate uh, diagnostics. So these are things like uh, looking at uh, heat fluxes, um, precipitation, um, uh, all kind of um, sea surface temperatures. Uh, and you know, we're, we're really leveraging here off of um, a great amount of work done in for the atmosphere model, the CAM 
and, and the uh, CCSM4 uh, um, looking at. So you can get this, these uh, simple NCL scripts. There's lots of information um, at the website on how to pull these down. Run the scripts, um, and there's a bit of setup there, but once you do run them, and then you can uh, modify a input file and run the script, and it will generate a whole slew of web pages for you that are really nice. You can go in, and the first web page is a list of tables, gives you global mean, hemispheric mean, um, things like the net shortwave radiation going out of the top, top of the model, uh, mean surface temperature, uh, cloud cover, all those sort of things. So really, really nice. And then you can get into line plots here, things like, um, uh, a meridional heat flux, those sort of things. And then further and further, here's the map, you can look at SSTs, you can look at ice, uh, cover, those sort of things. So, so here's uh, some examples. If you can also run diagnostics for the other components, um, if you take the data, data output for an interactive run, it, you can look at the, uh, say for instance, the N3.4 index, for, which is ENSO index here, and you can see its variability It'll generate wavelets, plots, showing the kind of variability in the ocean. Um, give you uh, uh, periodograms and order correlation. If you run the, run the diagnostics on the ice, you can see, you can compare your ice distribution if you're running with an interactive ice model with, uh, say, observations. Um, this is, uh, so I think this is ice thickness. Maybe this is ice cover. Yeah. Oh, that's the difference. I see that's the difference between the two, yeah. Okay, um, I think last few slides here. Um, so you've got a model and um, you think it lo looks reasonable, but you'd really like a, 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 um, a, a validation set. Uh, you, you're worried about the port, whether, whether it's producing a reasonable climate. We, we do have on the Earth system grid um, uh, output from long pre-industrial control simulations here. Um, so you can pull this down. Here's, a, I think, a 20-year um, set of output. You can pull that down. Or you can actually just um, look at the, the, those same diagnostics generated from, from, from this. So, you can, so all of these diagnostics can be um, pulled down for the control simulation, and you can compare them against your simulation. So... Um, I think that's it. Um, we have, you've already heard about the bulletin board. That's probably the first place to um, write a request. Um, so if it's, uh, if you're having trouble running CAM, then you would go to that part of the bulletin board. If you want uh, to run, uh, if you're getting into real issues of running Wacom, then you'd post to the Wacom. And if um, it's something really specific, um, then contact the liaison, or if he hasn't checked the bulletin board in a few days and you're waiting for, waiting for something, or you could just ping him and say, I've sent a post-it on the, on the bulletin board, can you take a look? Um, that would be good. The reason we like people to use the bulletin board is because I'm sure a lot of people are trying to solve the same problems, and so we're kind of building um, you know, a, a, a database of frequently asked questions or those sort of things interactively with the community. So with that, I'll take any questions. Susan? Yeah. Okay, so the, the question was in GOV, which is the IDL widget, can you output the data, the plot, say, that you've generated, the data from the plot you've generated? So if you decided to make a global mean, can you output that global mean data? And the answer is yes. So if you, anything you see on the screen, a figure you've made, there's an out option to output to NetCDF, and it will just dump that data into a small NetCDF file that you could then plot up for publication or something else, or compare it to something else. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, you could use that to, uh, to inform how you would modify a boundary file, sure. 